Hi, I'm Randall, co-host of The Drumming Show. We're pleased to bring you episode one in four short chapters. Our guests are Scott Paulson and Barb Smith, professional steel drum players and educators from the Vermont Independent School of the Arts. Our host, Bob Sparadeo, introduces Scott and Barb's performance of Cachita on the steel drums. Later, we learn about making, tuning, and some basics about playing of the pans. By the way, if you want to watch the entire show in one piece as it was originally recorded, please visit us at cnow.tv. That's cnow.tv. Now let's get started with Chapter 4, the final part of Episode 1 of The Drumming Show with Scott Paulson and Barb Smith. Welcome back. Island Time Steel Pan Band will now perform Cachita. And uh, we'll be giving you several views so you get a perspective from behind the drums as well. Enjoy. So now we're going to talk a little bit about basic construction and then uh, have these guys play backwards, which is, you know, just to challenge them. Can you tell us something about the basic operation of how a hammer causes notes to come out of a steel drum? Okay. <laughs> it's a short story. Uh, not really. This is the bottom end of the oil barrel. So initially it was flat. And typically today, I mean, they, they used to do just a big old sledgehammer with kind of a lot of the handle cut off, but through hours and hours and hours of going around and pounding it, they get it down to this bowl shape. Um, pretty much now, like, especially in the States when they're making pens, they use a pneumatic hammer. Mm -hmm. So they're just holding this thing and there's a little activator that goes down and brrr, it goes around. And But you have to push the metal in a certain way because you actually want to get more of the metal into the center because when it's pulled down that far, it's getting really thin and you can split them. Mm. You know, this, you got to imagine this was flat, so there's a lot more distance here than there used to be. So uh, then they come along and traditionally they would take something like a punch tool, like you'd set nails with and just with a hammer and go ding, 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 and make these grooves to outline the areas after they've just kind of pencil lined them in. Is that you know, why they it sounds so up. groovy? Ooh, <laughs> that's it, Bob. That's it. <laughs> um, 
and that, but that doesn't dictate the pitch. I mean, yes, you know, this note needs a certain amount of area to ring, but that isn't totally dictated just by the amount of space that it's in. It's really all on the skill of the tuner to shape the note inside that space. And this could be any one of like six or seven different notes if he chose. So they could mix the notes around. But anyway, um, so after they've, they've done that out, they kind of re-smooth the grooves back out. The purpose of the grooves is just to keep, you know, when you're playing this note, you know, you're ringing this note and this note a little bit. Not a lot, but it, that, that groove in there does help keep the vibrations from traveling from one note to the next. Isolates it. Right, isolates it. And, you know, but even so, when you're tuning this, it is affecting the one next to it. So the rest is just the skill of the tuner. They do fire them after they get to a certain point to anneal the metal to take the tension out so that they don't split as they keep working it because, you know, if you think about a paper clip and you do this to it enough, it breaks. And the same thing would happen to this. So they take the tension back out of it and then they do a final tuning before they chrome um, to put it into pitch. Then they chrome it, which knocks it back out of pitch, and then they have to blend it back in. Um, but the tuning, it's, it takes, they say it takes about eight years of doing it full time to get really good at it. So, uh, wow. you know, we don't mess with that. A couple emergency situations I've been taught just enough to like if one note gets knocked out and like we have a gig that day, I kind of know not, how not to ruin the note. I may not get that nice ringy chimey sound back, but I probably know enough where I can get it back into pitch. But it's not as simple as, oh, I hit it from the bottom and it goes higher and I hit it from the top and it goes lower because it's all about the shape of the note. So sometimes you can make the note higher by hitting it on the top in the right places. It's a really, it's voodoo to me. Interesting. It's voodoo. And the guys that do it are just amazing. So that's, that's the basic construction. And this is the lead pan. Well, they used to, they, initially they were called the ping pong. Remember I said they weren't real ringy in the beginning earlier? Well, so when you have a note, kind of sounds like ping pong, ping pong. Oh. So they call them ping pongs. And then they call them tenor pans, which is inaccurate because it's not a tenor voice. It's a soprano voice. Mm. So now we typically call them leads because they play the lead part, the melody part. And can you explain a little bit about the setup of the notes? The notes. And that's probably the trickiest part about playing. It'd be really great if steel drums were laid out like a piano. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, because that would make sense. But the problem is, as I said earlier, you know, when you're playing, say, this note, this one and this one are ringing just a little bit. Well, so you can't put notes next to each other that don't sound nice together. And if you know, if you play piano and you play C and C sharp together, you get something like this. We try to keep those notes apart. So you have to have notes that harmonize. And for any students of music theory out there, this is a physical representation of the circle of fifths. So going in this direction, La da 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 da, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> All right, so we got fifths going in this direction. If you're going the opposite direction, it would be fourths because they reciprocate. So notes. And this is the lowest range of the lead pan. This is middle C, the lowest note. So as we go into the center, I shouldn't tell you this because it makes it seem less impressive. It's just the octave above. So here's low C, high C, low G, high G. We even go up to the third octave. We've got about two and a half octaves hmm. here. So that's basically it. That's amazing. Yeah. And the rest is just mallet technique. Um, you know, I, I always, when I teach students, I talk about the rubber, the rubber pencil trick. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how kind of you want to hold the mallets because especially younger players will go and they're like, this note doesn't work. I'm like, hold the mallet loosely. So that's part of it. But she has more than I have. I've noticed. There's a reason. Multi and that is? Multitasking. Uh -huh. Men are too linear to play more than <laughs> one drum. So Scott's pan was made by Billy Sheeter, who is our, one of our two steel drum tuners that come up once a year, um, from, originally from West Virginia, the other is Darren Dyke, and uh, they tune all of our drums at our school. Uh, this pan was made by Phil Solomon out of Pittsburgh, who is originally from Trinidad, and this is called a double lead, or a double second. And I have the same amount of notes on these pans 
that Scott does on that one pan, two and a half octaves. So some of my notes overlap with Scott, some of the, a few in the middle here, but the, the lower ones overlap with the next voice of pan called guitars or cellos as well. Um, so when you want to make lower notes in the steel drum world, you need more space. So that's why as the steel drum voices get lower, you add more drums. So the next voice below this would be guitar pans, and they, they are also two pans, and they cover about an octave and a half. Right, and it, they're, yeah. they're actually the tenor range. Yes. Mm -hmm. They call them, well, I mean, the, the, naming of the, it, the naming of the different pans is interesting as well because these were all kind of coming together by different makers at the same time, so it's kind of incongruous why they named this a lead. That's double second. Well, there's two of them, and it's the second voice down from the top. That makes sense. The next one's called guitar. What? <laughs> Why guitar? Well, it's because of what they do in the band. You know, a typical role for the guitar pan player in the band, and also we said the notes overlap, but it's more about what they do. So they'll be playing along in a tune, and their job is to go da 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 da. So they're playing yeah. like what a electric guitar would play in a reggae band. Mm -hmm. chunka, mm chunka, mm chunka. That's their job in the band, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's why they call those guitars. Then they have the cello pans, which are below guitars, and they have some counter like bass melodies, but they also strum. And the voice below cellos are tenor basses, which is an octave above bass pans, and those are four oil drums. Um, and they play bass lines. And then the, the final voice typically is a six bass, sometimes a nine, nine bass. Nine or more. Wow. Played by one person. Full oil drums that you stand in the middle of and you play the bass lines. The, no the notes are so low, there's only three yeah. notes in each pan. So to get an octan octave and a half of notes, you need six of them. So that person has to really move. They really yeah. work. <laughs> and the mallets get bigger because you need like more surface area on the mallet head to make a lower note ring. So like our mallets for our bass pans are just like play balls you'd get from Walmart that are the size of a softball with a hole drilled and stuck on a drumstick. <laughs> those are the mallets for those. But our, my job here and, and when we play as a duo is I do some strumming and I do some counter melody and occasionally melody. So I'm really more of a supportive role to Scott who plays primarily melody. So. That's just because I played this first. It's not because, you know, like we go back to the linear thing and women can handle more. <laughs> That's basically the drum. And you did a magnificent job of explaining it. And, and they are so beautiful. I mean, when you, not only just aesthetically, but as you get down in the octave, you could see where the, the fundamental pitch is just so broad. And, and they're yes. very nice on it. There are a lot of um, church group, group, steel pan groups in churches because they blend so well with like the organ and the chimes. And mm. so that's a lot. And harmonica. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so if you have questions, um, these nice folks are able to be contacted uh, with what you see below your screen now. And uh, very accessible and great promoters of the art, um, as you'll find with many musicians that have devoted their life to it, as these fine musicians have. Um, it's about commitment. It's about wanting to share that talent and that gift with other people. So we uh, really encourage people to get involved and goof around and check it out and ask questions and have some fun in your life. You're here. You're here. And thanks for joining us. And thank you, Barb and Scott. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. All right. See you soon. I hope you've enjoyed Chapter 4 of our four-part series. Please come back again next week as we begin a new episode. Episode 2 of The Drumming Show. Remember, if you want to watch the entire show in one piece as it was originally recorded, please visit us at cnow.tv. That's C-N-O-W TV. If you're listening on the audio podcast and want to reach Scott Paulson and Barb Smith, their email address is V as in Vermont, I-S-A-V-T at AOL.com. That's V-I-S-A-V-T at AOL.com. Or reach them by phone at area code 802 Two three four six nine eight seven. That's eight zero two two three four six nine eight seven.